We're going to hop right into the message because this is not going to be a typical sermon. We're going to do some deep sea diving today into the scriptures, which means if you're sleeping, you might get drowned in the deep today. Put, you're going to have to put on your goggles, your oxygen tank, your wetsuits, because we're going to go deep into the word of God. OK, the title of today's sermon is called the ministry of heresies, the ministry of heresies. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for your word and that the Bible says we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And I pray, O oh God, as we open your word, that we approach your word with the right spirit and with humility, knowing that your word is a lamp and a light and your word does not come back void. And your word is like a hammer and like a fire, and it breaks the rocks in pieces. And by your word were the heavens made, and where the word of a king is, there is power. And so, Lord, we open your word, and we pray that you open our hearts, forgive us of our sins, and teach us wonderful things out of your law, and lead us to glory. This is our prayer, because we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, ministry of heresies. So let's start off with some heresies. This is taken from Spectrum Magazine. The date is May 2018. The title of the article is The Great Controversy Shackles Adventist Theology. The book Great Controversy Shackles. Adventist theology. This is an Adventist publication, and now the author, who's a very smart man, begins to talk about the 2300 evenings and mornings, how that is not 2300 years. He totally discredits the beginning of the 2300 years and also the end, 1844. He then begins to talk about the Great Controversy book, how it's anti-Catholic, it's old-fashioned, it was written for back in Ellen White's day, and that the heavenly sanctuary and the investigative judgment doctrines are basically a bunch of baloney. This is what he says. And I conclude reading the last paragraph of this article, Seventh-day Adventist publication. The Catholic Inquisition condemned Galileo for refuting the creation dogma that God fixed the earth upon its foundations not to be moved forever. He was forced to recant his findings that the earth moves around the sun. Galileo told the Catholic Church through science the earth moves around the sun. The sun doesn't go around the earth. The church says you're wrong, Galileo. The author continues, it took 350 years for the church to finally concede that he was right. We should not make the same mistake in supporting error and certainly not wait as long to concede that we erred. The error that he's talking about is the book Great Controversy, and we erred in 1844 because the sanctuary message and the doctrine in 1844 is the most colossal face-covering device in human history. Next article of heresy, also taken from Adventist publication, Spectrum Magazine. The title of the article, 1844, Pillar of Faith or Mortal Wound. The author then goes to explain how 1844 is a mortal wound. We need to fess up and come up to the point that it was just a cover-up and it is fake, it is not in Scripture. The 2300 days, the year day principle is folly. The decree that the Bible talks about in Daniel chapter nine is not the decree of Artaxerxes, it is the decree of Cyrus. The decree of Cyrus was in 538 BC. What happens to the 2300 day prophecy or 1844 if the decree starts in 538? It changes. It completely throws it out of the window. He then goes to the book of Hebrews. 
Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 10. And he says these verses clearly show us that Jesus ascended after his crucifixion and went into the most holy place to sit on the right-hand side of the Father. He didn't wait till 1844 to do this. He's been there since his ascension. I conclude with the last paragraph. My experience as a Bible exegete, by the way, these guys have their PhDs, their doctorate, doctors, they're very smart men. My experience as a Bible exegete is that it appears that we have been given into the temptation to hold on to tradition instead of continuing to study scripture. We have overstated our case and stretched the evidence in order to confirm our prophetic identity. And frankly, frankly, that is all 1844 really is. It only massages our corporate ego. It does little for the individual believer. I can believe that Jesus has been my perfect intercessor since the ascension without jeopardizing my standing with God. In other words, 1844 only massages our corporate ego. I'm totally fine believing that Jesus went to the most holy place after his ascension because biblically I cannot find that in Scripture. Now this, what I've just read, is not an isolated incident. Unfortunately, during my time in Adventist education, this is a prevailing thought. When I was active on Facebook, I was part of a group of Adventist ministers and laymen and doctors and teachers and, <coughs> excuse me, and somebody posted about 1844, and I wasn't surprised because I heard it so many times, but I was kind of blown away by the, the amount of responses from preachers and pastors who then start to articulate these same beliefs that I just read to you today. Now, we're going to look at the scriptures and look at some things to answer some of these questions. Now I'm going to look at the spirit of prophecy. Sister White says this, the scripture which above all others had been both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration. I took the scripture off of the screen because I wanted to see if somebody could tell me the scripture. Above all others has been both the foundation and central pillar. What scripture do you think that is of the Advent faith? Say it again. It's, you said 14. Close, but not it. Anybody guess? How about Daniel 8, verse 14? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Notice what she says in Great Controversy 409. The scripture which above all others has been both the foundation and central pillar. That has to do with the sanctuary message, the 2300 days. The articles that I read to you are specifically attacking the sanctuary message. When you do away with the foundation and the central pillar, what happens to the house? The Adventist church was built on that text, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The calculation from 457 to 1844 and that Christ, what did Christ do in 1844, church? He went into the most holy place in 1844. And Sister White is saying this is the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith. And many within the church and without in the regular Christian world, they attack what we put forth because this is the unique contribution of the Adventist church. We believe in the sanctuary message. No other church is preaching the investigative judgment in 1844 and has the interpretation of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, unto 2,300 days. No other church. So if you take that out, the whole Adventist house falls. She goes on to say, Satan is striving continually 
to bring in fanciful suppositions in regard to the sanctuary, degrading the wonderful representations of God and the ministry of Christ for our salvation into something that suits the carnal mind. Thus he would rob us of our faith in the very message that has made us a separate people and has given character and power to our work. She goes on to say, The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Some, all, need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priests. Otherwise, if we don't have this knowledge, look what happens. It will be impossible for you, for me, to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs for us to fill. According to Sister White, this is of utmost importance. Says the great deceiver. Who's the great deceiver? So now let's think about this. She is eavesdrop, eavesdropping on Satan's conversation. How is she able to do that? We must watch those, this is Satan speaking, we must watch those who are calling the attention of the people to the Sabbath of Jehovah. They will lead many to see the claims of the law of God. And the same light which reveals the true Sabbath reveals also the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and shows that the last work for man's salvation is now going forward. Hold the minds of the people in darkness till that work is ended and we shall secure the world and the church also. So according to Satan, let's shut down this sanctuary message. Let's take it out of the church. Let's divert our minds from it. And as a result, I got the church and the world. Question, when Christ came the first time, did Satan do that to the sanctuary message? Did he divert the sanctuary message? Did he pollute its meaning? Sister White says it was so polluted that it was used to blind the people and it had to be done away with. But it wasn't a pollution to everyone's mind. Now, when you throw away the sanctuary message... And there are many in our church who are doing this. Inadvertently or directly or even indirectly, whether they know it or not, they're also throwing down the spirit of prophecy in the ministration of Ellen White. Because how in the world is she eavesdropping on Satan who's saying that we got to get rid of the sanctuary? How in the world is she receiving communications from heaven that tells her of the importance of the sanctuary? But yet these ministers and doctors and many in our church say it's not important. It's not in the Bible. So it's a twofold package. You throw away the sanctuary, you throw away the Adventist church, and you also throw away the spirit of prophecy. Indirectly, whether you know it or not, you're calling it satanic. Because how can you build a church on lies? Saying that God has spoken to you but that the doctrine is from the Bible. Today we're going to look at the Bible because we're going to understand that the 2300 day prophecy and the sanctuary message did not originate with Ellen White. It originated through scripture. Historically, you can prove this. In 1844, Ellen White was 17 years old. The sanctuary doctrine was in the church before 1844. The state of the dead was in the church before 1844. The Sabbath message was even in the church before 1844. God had his truth in the church. And it was in the Bible long before Ellen White was in, even in the picture. And this is off topic, but kind of on topic. The mark of the beast I have an article from the 1600s of a man that talks about Sunday law enforcement being the mark of the beast. That's God's truth. And I'll show that at a later, later time. That's a good one. Yes. Please don't apologize. Yeah, that's Testimonies to Ministers, page 472, paragraph 2. Please ask questions. This is going to be a, let's get involved together. In the future, deception of every kind is to arise. 
and we want solid feet for our, solid ground for our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. This is very powerful because <laughs> these people are saying the Lord didn't establish and they're not attacking nobody else but God. Not one pin, the enemy will bring in false theories such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. Where shall we find safety unless it be in the truths that the Lord has been given for the last 50 years? Now, I have entitled this presentation, The Ministry of Heresies. There was a book by W.D. Frazee. You can find it on Amazing Facts. I had this booklet. And in this booklet, he lists three primary reasons why heresies are good in the church. I'm going to talk about two. Number one, the reason why heresies are good, because it separates the wheat from the chaff. That's the second reason. It makes you know your Bible. There are only really two main things. When Desmond Ford started to preach that there was no sanctuary, a third of the pastors in Australia left the church. But then there were many who decided to go to their, to their Bible and find out what does the Bible say. So that's the blessing of the ministry of heresies. So heresies are good in a way, amen? Because it wakes us up to put on our goggles and our oxygen tanks and our wetsuits so we can go deep sea diving, amen? This statement about the sanctuary, if you notice the pink or the purple or whatever, it's written in 1905. It's written in 1905 because she's addressing this man, A.F. Ballinger, who starts to raise up very similar arguments that I just read in these articles about the sanctuary. Stating that God has went into the most holy place right after his ascension, there is no 1844. That is a complete fallacy. A.F. Ballinger was born in Illinois in 1861. He became a great preacher in the Adventist church. He was a pastor and a minister in England, Ireland, and Wales. In 1905, when she wrote that statement, he started to preach his views that 1844 is basically a bunch of baloney and Christ went into the most holy place after his ascension. He was brought to the executive board of the General Conference in 1905. He got to give his position and subsequently he was disfellowshipped from the church. It's interesting, they used to disfellowship people back in the day, but they don't do that nowadays. They disfellowshipped him from the church, and then he wrote a book in 1909. His father and his brother and others followed him. The title of his book was Cast Out for the Cross of Christ, because he was cast out for the church. And then he takes us to the book of Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews 6. Now we're putting on our goggles. We're going to put on our goggles, and we're going to see what Ballinger those in this article and many others are saying about Christ and his ministry. Hebrews chapter 6. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Hebrews 6, and let's look at verses 19 and 20. The Bible says this. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Ballinger says there it is. Jesus the high priest entered within the veil, and that is the most holy place. Case close. The book of Hebrews was written around A.D. 64 and 66. It wasn't written in 1844, for Paul wasn't alive. So he wrote this, and here is the high priest that has entered into the most holy place within the veil, not in 1844. He brings not the most holy place, but the holy place. But Ballinger brings up five witnesses from the Old Testament in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers that clearly show that every time the phrase within the veil is used, it points to the most holy place and not the holy place. 
five witnesses in the Old Testament. Then he shows 12 witnesses in the Old Testament that clearly show the phrase without the veil is the only phrase that refers to the holy place. But here you are, Ellen White, saying that within the veil means the holy place. But the Bible says within the veil means the most holy place. And only without the veil refers to the holy place. Does that make sense, everybody? We haven't put on our wetsuits yet. So this is what he says. Your writings or the word of God, what should I choose? Notice what he says. And now, Sister White, what can I do? If I accept the testimony of the scriptures, if call me a wolf in sheep's clothing and warn my brethren and my members of my family against me, but when I turn in my sorrow to the word of the Lord, that word reads the same. And I fear to reject God's interpretation and accept yours. Oh, that I might accept both. But if I must accept but one, hadn't I better accept the Lord's? If I reject his word and accept yours, can you save me in the judgment? When side by side we stand before the great white throne, if the master should ask me why I taught that within the veil was in the first apartment of the sanctuary, what shall I answer? Shall I say because Sister White, who claimed to be commissioned to interpret the scriptures for me, told me that this was the true interpretation and that if I did not accept it and teach it, I would rest under your condemnation? A.F. Ballinger, cast out for the cross of Christ, 1909, chapter 12. That's strong. What am I supposed to do? The Bible is telling me one thing, but your word is contradicting the Bible. I got to stand to see God. You're not going to save me in the judgment. Woo, that's strong. When you look at A.F. Ballinger's life, there's a lot that led up to this moment. Moment. This is in 1905. He wrote this in 1909. He was disfellowshipped in 1905. But in 1891, I believe, or it was 1881, 1891, Ella White has written statements or letters to him warning him of his ways. When you look at his background of his life and the things that he was into leading up, it's very eye-opening. But I'll save that for another time. That also goes with D.M. Canwright and many others. But let's make the situation a little worse. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8. These are the verses that folks like, that was quick. Amen, amen. (laughs) Hebrews chapter (laughs) 9. He read my mind. I was going to say when you get there, say amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8. The Holy Ghost... This signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, in the, what does your Bible say? Does it say holiest of all in verse 8? What does yours say? Most holy, holiest of all, holiest of all. So now... Is that the most holy place or the holy place? That seems like the most holy place. So here in the book of Hebrews, it's saying that the way into the most holy place was not made open while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, the first tabernacle is the earthly tabernacle. So when the earthly tabernacle is done away with, which was done away at the cross, that means that the way into the most holy place was made open. We got a problem. That was A.D. 31, not 1844. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. We there? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the what? Holiest. Anybody have a different translation? Holiest. What's the holiest? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the what? Mercy. That is to say his flesh. 
So I'm reading in the book of Hebrews that the holiest of all, the way was made open. That having boldness to enter into the holiest and that Christ went in within the veil. There you have it, case closed. 1844 is out the window. Jesus didn't go into the most holy place in 1844. He's been there since A.D. 31. That's what these people are arguing. That's what Ballinger's saying. And that's why it's very important that we say praise the Lord for the ministry of heresies. Because what does this do? Man, I need to get my oxygen tank. I need to get my breather, my wetsuit, and I'm going to go deep sea diving now. You guys ready? Let's see what the scriptures have to say. Now, the book of Hebrews is written in 8064, 66, and it says these pretty powerful things. But let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, once again. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That word holiest in the Greek is the word, and I'm going to pull it up right here, hagion. Can everyone say hagion? Hagion is the plural in the genitive case of the word hagios, which means holy. Hagion literally means, it's plural, holies. So the way into the holies, keep that in mind. It's also translated as, let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 2. Now, these are just something, things that I'm finding along the way. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 2. It says, a minister of the what? Of the what? That's the word hagion. That's hagion. A minister of the sanctuary. It's plural. Now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8. This is the word hagion here. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the Hagion, it's not holiest of all. It's not the most holy place. This is referring to the holies and translated in Hebrews 8 verse 2 as the sanctuary. Now when we go to Hebrews 10 verse 19, let's go back to Hebrews 10 verse 19. Let's plug in the word sanctuary because this is not talking about the most holy place. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the sanctuary or the holies by the blood of Jesus. Does that make it a little clearer? You don't have to know much Greek, but you got to know a little Greek to read Hebrew. Did you get it? Greek to read Hebrews. <laughs> Just a little bit. It helps. Now, this is so powerful. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and in these verses, he gives us the definition of terms. Let's read verses 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of a divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, the table of showbread, which is called the what? Now notice what he says. He says that in the tabernacle, in verse, the beginning of verse 2, for there was a tabernacle made, and he says the first. So he's talking about the first compartment of the sanctuary. Now it, the first compartment has the, the candlesticks, the table of showbread, but notice what he calls it in verse 2, which is called the what? So he says the first compartment is called the, in the Greek, it's not hagion. This is the word hagia. In this case, it's also used as tahagia, that's plural as well. I'm, I'm discovering these things but it's very beautiful when you look at it. He is telling us that the first compartment is, can everyone say Hagia? Let's listen what else he tells us. In verse three, 
And after the second veil, which implies that there's a first veil, right? So this is the second veil, right? Now he says, after the second veil, what does he say? The tabernacle, which is called the what? Do you know what this is in the Greek? That's Hagia. Hagia, Hagion. This word literally means holies or holy in the singular. So guess what this means? Holy of holies. The only place in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament where you find the most holy place described, and he says, it is the Hagia Hagion. You know in Hebrew what they call the most holy place, you find a lot of places, is Kodesh, which is holy, Kodeshim, holies. Singular and plural. It's to emphasize the holiness of it. And he indicates it's behind this, which veil, the first or the second? The second veil. Now let's look at verse 4. He begins to describe what's in this room. Which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. Notice the last part of which we cannot now speak particularly. You know what he's saying here? I'm not going to be talking about this yet. The purpose of what I'm writing about is not to focus on here. I'm going somewhere else. That is so key. Now, let's see what we've learned. The Hagia, he defines as the first apartment, literally means holies. And the only definition for the most holy place is Hagia Hagion. Okay? So when you look through the entire book of Hebrews, where Christ enters, or this goes in, or wherever you find the word for sanctuary, holiest, or most holy, there's only one place in this Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3 that talks about the most holy place. And when you look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, let's look there. But into the what? Went the high priest with who? How often? That's talking about the most holy place. Because he says into the second. Now we're going to get a little more technical. The, the word second is the Greek word deuteros. You ever heard of the word deuteronomy? It's the second rendering of the law. So this is the second veil. He clearly says the second or the second veil in the Hagia Hagion is the most holy. And he talks about the high priest bringing blood once a year into this place. So Hagia literally means holies. Hagia Hagion is the holy of holies. Show you again. Now let's look at these verses one more time. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2, is the word Hagia. We know that that's talking about the first apartment. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8 is the word Hagion, and it's not talking about the holiest of all because the word holiest of all is what? Hagia Hagion. So that's not it. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood... He entered in once into the, that's the word Hagia. So it's not talking about the most holy place here either. Let's go to verse 24 of chapter 9. For Christ is not entered into the, guess what word that is? That's the word Hagia. Tahagia. Holy places are used in the singular for the first apartment. It's not used for the most holy place. So he hasn't entered into the most holy place here either. Now let's look at verse 25. We're going to get a little more technical here. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. Now surely he's talking about the most holy place here because he's talking about the high priest. And he says, every year. 
Now, this is where we got to put our goggles on again. Because the word here, the holy place, is not Hagia Hagion. It's Hagia. So it's talking about Christ not entering into the most holy place here, but into the sanctuary. And what's the first room in the sanctuary? You can't skip the, you can't just teleport to the most holy place without going into the holy place. But notice in the Greek, where it's, well you can, but I'm going to tell you. Where it says the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. Into the holy place every year, the Greek looks exactly the same, identical, when you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Let's look at that. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, here it is, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Here is not talking about the day of atonement. In Hebrews 10.1, these are the, year, the sacrifices that are offered throughout the year for the daily service. The better translation of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, is that the high priest enters into the Hagia throughout the year. Throughout the year. Because the only place in Hebrews that specifies that the high priest enters into the most holy place once a year, and the Greek is totally different. It's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, where we just read. Let's look back at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. Thank you. But into the what? Not the Hagia. Into the second went the high priest alone once every year. When you look at that in the original language, it's completely different from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, and Hebrews 10, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to make it really simple for you. The only time that the author of Hebrews talks about the most holy place is in Hebrews 9, verse 3 and 9, 7, where he particularly uses key words so that we can know this is the Hagia Hagion and it's beyond the second veil in the second apartment. Everywhere else where Christ has entered throughout the book of Hebrews that we've looked at, clearly shows that Christ did not go into the most holy place, but he went into the Hagia. Now bear with me. I'm going to read some scholarly things over here. But notice this. But if the author of Hebrews is indebted throughout his epistle to the Septuagint usage, anybody know what the Septuagint is? The Septuagint was the Greek Bible that Paul and Peter and them read back in their day. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Many of the Jews didn't know Hebrew, they read Greek. But Paul knew Hebrew and Greek. So, but if the author of Hebrews is indebted throughout his epistle to the Septuagint usage, as is almost universally recognized by scholars, then the evidence points in a different direction than the whole, most holy place as the correct translation of tahagia, hagia. The term tahagia, ta is the definite article, the hagia, or the holies, or the holy place. The term tahagia is the regular Septuagint term for the sanctuary as a whole, not for the most holy place alone. A recent thesis by a man named Carl Kozert has confirmed, and this is Dr. Richard Davison from Andrews University who's speaking here, has confirmed my own research that throughout the Septuagint, Tahagia is regularly employed to refer to the whole sanctuary in general. Kosert also shows this to be the case in other early Greek literature of Judaism, Pseudepigrapha, Philo, Josephus. He further demonstrates that in both Septuagint and other early Jewish literature, tahagia is never used. How often? Never. never used to describe the most holy place alone. So not only in the Greek Bible is it never used, hagia, for the most holy place, 
but also in the ancient writings of those times, Pseudepigrapha, Josephus, and Philo, and other Greek writings, not once is it ever used for the most holy place. That is a very strong argument because many within our church and outside our church will say that Christ went into the most holy place and they look at the word hagia, tahagia, but it's never once used for the most holy place. Does that make sense? I'm gonna read this last little statement. Carl Kozert examines, and I doubt Carl Kozert is even an Adventist. These are probably secular scholars or other Christian scholars, I should say. He examines 109 occurrences in the Septuagint and never does it refer to the most holy place alone, but to the holy place and most likely the sanctuary as a whole. Does that make sense? That's my little scholarly spill article. So Hagia is used for the sanctuary, the holy place, but never the most holy place. So now, Hebrews 6.19, what we talked about with Ballinger. Here's some things I just want to share with you as I'm looking at that verse, that Christ went within the veil. So now, in the Greek, when Christ goes within the veil, there's a special Greek word for veil, and I'm going to put it up on the board in just a minute. Remember, throughout the rest of the book of Hebrews, Christ has never entered into the most holy place. I'm not talking about Hebrews 6, but everywhere else we looked was Hagia. So everywhere else that Christ has entered, in Hebrews chapter 10, we can see Hebrews 9, 24, 25, any place where we have the entering scriptures, it's always talking about the Hagia, the first apartment, or the sanctuary. Is that clear? So now when we look at Hebrews chapter 6, we have to keep that in mind. That the author says, I'm not going to speak in particular about this. My focus is somewhere else. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. This is what I'm, this is what I'm learning in the conclusions that I'm coming to. He also specifies that the most holy place is beyond the second veil. However, in Hebrews chapter 6, it doesn't have that identifier, the second veil. It just says within the veil. Does that make sense? And also we talked about Hagia Hagion. Please stay with me. We're going to swim in the deep just a little bit longer. We'll come back to the surface, okay? Now, in the Greek, there's a, there's a special word for that word veil. In the Hebrew, there are two words for the word veil. For the most holy place, it's this Hebrew word called paroket. And in the Hebrew, for this first veil, it's called masak. Can everyone say paroket? And masak. Masak is the first veil, paroket is the second veil. But when you're looking at the Septuagint, when you're looking at the Greek, how many words do you think they have for the, for the veil? You know what? It's only one word. Matter of fact, it's the word katapatasma. That's quite a word, isn't it? Katapatasma. And guess what? That veil, the first curtain that you come in from the entrance, guess what that's called? Kata, kata, I do that, kata, katapatasma. So now, when you look at the book of Hebrews, it says he goes within the veil. Which veil did he go in? Because it's one of those three. Is it katapatasma number one, number two, or number three? It's important to do comparative studies because the objectors will say, well, the phrase within the veil in the Greek always refers to the most holy place. It does. In the Old Testament, it does. However, we, gotta, we could look at other scriptures and we must, but we cannot do that at the expense of what Paul wrote in Hebrews. He defined his own terms. He listed out what the Hagia Hagion is. He already listed out the second veil and the second compartment. And he, he clearly listed out everything else as the Hagia. 
And when you see the context of the book of Hebrews, not once is Christ in any other place, people will contend in Hebrews 6, not once is he enter into the most holy place because he's not speaking about these things in particular. This is not what it's about. I'm not referring to the day of atonement here. The Bible is amazing because you can look at the scriptures that's been around for hundreds, thousands of years, but the Bible was sealed. That means we, there are people who came before us looking at the same Bible, looking at the same Bible, but didn't have the understanding because it was sealed. And God said, seal it up, Daniel, until the time of the end. How deep is this book? That you can look at it and certain truths will come out at the right time. And so God unsealed it according to the time of the end. And Paul, before the sealing, wrote down, I'm not going to speak about this in particular. Whether he knew it or not, he was following the Holy Spirit because the time had not yet come. Now we see katapatasma, 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 and then he identifies that the second veil, the deuteros katapatasma, into the hagia hagion, of which right now I'm not going to speak in particular. That is the second compartment. These are, these are my, the weight of evidence that I see from the book of Hebrews. We can bank on one verse, but we look at the whole book of Hebrews and what Paul has defined in his terms. This is the most holy place. It is the Hagia Hagion. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Let's look at this verse. And I'm approaching, I'm landing the plane now. Hebrews 10, 19. I want to point out a couple of things here. Because there are many who recognize, even in this scholarly paper that I read, that Hebrews 10, 19 matches up with Hebrews 6, verses 19 and 20. Look what Hebrews 10, 19 says. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter. Now in Hebrews 6, is he entering something within the veil? Enter? Does the word enter? Amen. Then it says, into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the what? Through the what? So in Hebrews 10, there's an entering and it's through the veil. In Hebrews 6, there's an entering within the veil. But in Hebrews 10, he's entering into the Hagia Hagion? No. He's entering into the Hagia. He's entering into the Tahagia, not the Hagia Hagion. When you recognize this, it really complements other places of Scripture as well, of Christ's movements in the Bible. And I already talked about this part, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. I have some great studies that I can point you to, um, PDFs, videos, that will just blow what I'm telling you out of the water, and I pray, and I believe it will make it a lot more clearer. So please, I will email that to you. I will send you the links. We got to know this stuff. We got to study it and look at it. Amen? Amen. I can show you, and I want to show you. Now, if we, I'm closing up now. We as sinners, you know, we're back in these days. We bring our offering to the sanctuary. Man, that lamb, we kill that lamb. And now, what do we do next? Our hope is in that priest who can go into that place where we can't go. He's got to go inside. We as regular sinners can't go in there. When you go into that place of the sanctuary through that veil, there is cherubims and angels embroidered in the curtain. Because why? What does it represent when you go through that tent? It represents heaven. Because in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, it says that God did not go into the earthly tabernacle, but he went, made my hands, but he went into heaven itself. And the first compartment is the holy place. So when Jesus, the lamb, took our sins, he went into a place after his death that we could not go, and he entered in through that veil where my hope is, because it's in his hands. I, I can't do nothing else. I confess. I'm forgiven. I'm cleansed. Hallelujah. But now he presents his righteous blood, and he intercedes 
before the Father. He has the light of his spirit. Now what, what, what is that in there? How many candlesticks in there? You got the table of showbread, the light of his Holy Spirit, the sweet fragrance of his righteousness, his wonderful word. He's interceding. Now the high priest had on the breastplate of judgment, had all the names of the tribe of Israel, had the, had the Urim and the Thurim at his heart. The Bible says he had the names of the people on the shoulder and he would bear the names. Does, does Christ bear our names? He says, I've imprinted you guys on my hands and I walk into places that you can't go into and I bear your names. So we're with Christ in heavenly places. He's the veil that made that way for us to have access into the holy place and now into the most holy place. Somebody say amen. So the high priest would bear the names. This is all the object lesson to teach us about Jesus. The lamb is Jesus and the high priest. And I'm closing up here. The lamb is Christ. The high priest is Christ. And the high priest in the day of atonement is Christ. All these point to Christ. Now our objectors will bank on the lamb and some of the priests, but they will not finish the ministration of the priest. You see, they say that Christ, the atonement was complete at the cross. He already went into the most holy place straight away. We don't need the sanctuary to be cleansed or anything like that. That atonement is not necessary because the atonement was complete. But guess what, folks? The atonement is a sanctuary word. So when you say atonement, you're talking about the entire atonement process, and it reached a crescendo at the day of atonement. And when the sanctuary was cleansed, the high priest now brought the guilt or the culpabilities and the responsibilities and gave it to Satan after it was cleansed. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to tell you is this. It's real simple. Sanctuary message is under assault. Did God take us out of Egypt? How many of you want to be on the way to Canaan? Do you know what God gave the children of Israel on the way to Canaan? He gave them manna. What else did he give him? He gave him the tabernacle. He gave him the sanctuary on the way to Canaan. Folks, we need that. He gave him the quail, and they stuffed their mouths, didn't they? The Bible says, thy way, O God, is in the what? Sanctuary. Asaph says, I didn't receive any understanding about what happens in the world Things look crazy, upside down. We got coronavirus, we got riots, we got protests. Nothing makes sense. But until I went into the sanctuary of God, he says, then I understood their end. The sanctuary gives us understanding. Do you know when the kingdom of Israel separated from each other? The north and the south. Jeroboam made a fatal mistake. He says, I don't want people going to the sanctuary, so I'm going to start up my own worship service. Does anybody remember that? the first king of Israel. As a result of starting his own sanctuary service, every king in Israel was evil. It got to the point where it got so dark that God had to send the prophet who? During the time of Ahab, Elijah. You know what Elijah did? He built up the 12 stones and he prayed at the time of the evening sacrifice and pointed everybody back to the sanctuary. During the time of Christ, the same thing. Satan blinded the people away from the sanctuary and it had to be done away with. But when Christ was a 12-year-old boy and he went there for Passover, was he blinded? You know what happened to Christ when he saw the lamb and he saw the priest? He had understanding, he knew his identity, and he knew his mission. It's the same thing with us. Hold the minds of the people in darkness because if they throw away that sanctuary, they will not have their identity, their understanding, and they will not know their mission. I will secure the world and the church just like I did back then. I want to do it today. But guess what, folks? The Bible says that Christ died and he ascended to heaven on the right hand of the throne of the Father. People will say that's the most holy place, but listen, listen. The Bible in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, says that that little horn cast down his truth and his sanctuary to the ground, attacks the daily. In Revelation 13, he blasphemes God and his tabernacle. He's at war with the temple. 
the physical temple that was on the earth, and the one in heaven. He was a covering cherub. But guess what, folks? The prophet John was in the Isle of Patmos. Rome was ruling. Man, he had chains on. He was in rags. I'm sure he was having a rough life. But then the Spirit of the Lord caught John up in vision. And there was a door that was open in heaven. And the Lord said to John, come and see. And when John looked, guess where he was in Revelation chapter 4? He saw the throne of God. He saw the rainbow and lightnings and thunders, and he saw the 24 elders. He saw the four creatures, the seraphim with the wings and the eyes all about him. One looked like an eagle, a man, an ox. And they cried, holy, holy, holy. Before the throne, do you know what he saw? It was seven lamps of fire. Now, those seven lamps of fire... Is that found in the Hagia Hagion or the Hagia? So there you have it. The angel says, who's worthy to take the scroll and open the seals? Then there's a lamb that had been slain, walks to the father's throne, and is worthy to take the seals. Why? Because the elder tells John, don't cry because the lamb has prevailed. He had just been crucified. He had ascended to the Hagia where he took the scroll and was worthy to sit on the throne. You see how our message connects, folks? And later we're going to talk about what happened after God the Father and the Lamb was in the Hagia. How did they get to the Hagia Hagion? Amen? Has this been helpful a little bit? Does this make us want to deep, deep sea dive some more? If you guys have any questions or you would like any further resources to what I've shared with you today, please talk to me after the service and I'll be more than happy to refer you to some good concrete information. Amen? Our message is sure. We can lose nothing and do nothing against the truth but for the truth. And upon closer inspection, we ought to be able to stand on the word of God. Amen? Last thing I'm going to say is this. As an Adventist, me growing up, and many of us in the church, we can fall into the pit where we say, I was a, uh, my mom was an Adventist, my granddad was an Adventist, and I grew up in the church. And what happens is that we become cultural or traditional Adventists. But the pioneers were biblical Adventists. They knew the answers to all these questions because they studied their word. So it's time for us to be biblical Adventists. Amen? It's time for us to say amen to these heresies so we can go deep sea diving and know what the Bible says. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this study, Lord. Lord, I know it was intense. And I pray, God, that what was shared today, that your truth will continue to just marinate in our hearts that the questions that we still have about the truth that you've given us, that we would have the spirit to be like the Bereans, to study, to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I pray, God, that we can do this. You have given us this beautiful, deep, powerful word that is unsealed, treasures waiting to be found. And I pray, God, that we can have that hunger and thirst for righteousness to go on the hunt for what you have placed for us in our lives. Let us continue to understand the importance of this message, what it means for us today, and how we can spread the good news that you are on your throne no matter what. Thank you, Lord, for this, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord.